So we're beginning a new theme with this episode. We've been talking about innovation and entrepreneurship, and now we're talking about health and healing. So to start us off, we're really excited to dive into the health and healing conversation that everybody's having around the world right now. Uh, We want to talk about the words and stories that shape how we think about vaccines and vaccinations. You know, Holland, it really is fascinating um, when you when you understand the history and the stories behind this innovative medicine and why it's desired and sometimes feared. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Tiffany Threet and Dr. Brenton DeBoof. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Bolin. And you're listening to The Afterword, a conversation about the future of words. Tiffany is an associate professor of pharmacy and practice and the director of wellness center at Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina. Tiffany, welcome. Tell us a little bit more about your work and what's keeping you busy. Well, thank you for having me here today. And as you mentioned, I am um, an associate professor of pharmacy practice. And what that means is that I spend part of my time teaching students in the classroom and part of my time in a patient care clinic where I serve as director of our wellness center and coordinator of our diabetes care and education program. So I stay busy busy, and uh, immunizations or vaccines are a regular part of what I do with in my patients every day. I can't even imagine what your schedule must look like right now. It's never never the same. I bet, I bet, thank you. And Brent DeBoof is the uh, interim dean. Are you still interim, Brent? Yeah, I'm still interim. It's, it's like this constant limbo state. Okay. The interim dean of the graduate school and professor of chemistry at the University of Rhode Island. And in full disclosure, I've known Brent for how long have you and Amanda been married? Uh, I should know. 20 years. 20 years. Oh. Okay. So I've known you since basically the wedding. But we, we didn't ask you because of that. We asked you because uh, of your experience. And Amanda said that you had been talking about this with some... Uh, some folks around the world. So we wanted to hear a little bit about it. Uh, can you tell us a little, a little bit more about your background and professional experience? Well, before I get in too much trouble with both you and my wife, Holland, uh, I, I realized it's 21 years. And so <laughs> so that's, that's the big oops right there. But uh, um, yeah, it's 21 years. So well, it was June and this is February. So that kind of throws everything off. Let, let's, kill, let's go with that. That's right. There you go. Excellent. Excellent recovery, Britain. Thanks. So, okay. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a chemist. I'm an organic chemist by training. Uh, that really means I'm a molecule nerd, you know, where some people are, you know, computer nerds, some people are music nerds. I just live and to think about molecules. This is, this is what really excites me and what keeps me busy. Um, and so my research is, is in the field of, like I said, of organic synthesis, where we're the type of people that build molecules. We don't necessarily uh, cure diseases, but you know, whatever, if there's any given disease, the cure to it or, or the treatment for it will be a molecule. And so we're the people that make those molecules. Um, and so I've been, I'm, again, I'm not a vaccine specialist, but, uh, but some of my students go on to work uh, at, at, at in uh, companies that make vaccines. In fact, I have one former student, uh, not just students I've taught in the classroom, but students that have worked in my lab that now works for Moderna and other students that work for Pfizer. In fact, I used to, um, just being in Rhode Island, we're literally located right in between Moderna and Pfizer. Um, and I used to teach classes at Pfizer uh, as part of their, you know, kind of employee training programs as well. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So both of you have these fascinating backgrounds. I'm a little intimidated um, by the depth of knowledge that we have at the afterward table tonight. But I would love for both of you in just 60 seconds to give us the Cliff Notes version of your life and just tell us who you are, how you got there, and why you're doing what you're doing. Tiffany, we'll start with you. Oh, wow. 60 seconds. That's, uh, let me see if I can do this. Um, so I worked in a community pharmacy after I got out of pharmacy school, Walgreens primarily, for about 12 years before moving into academia. And it was there that I first became trained to give immunizations. That was back in 2008, 2009, right before the H1N1 pandemic occurred. And as Walgreens was becoming interested in offering immunizations in their stores, I stepped up and became the coordinator um, and trainer for immunizations for my district. 
Uh, we didn't have a full plan as to how this would work. Literally at this point, Walgreens was just asking interested pharmacists to volunteer to become trained. And I remember early on, I sat down with the district manager and I suggested that for the program to really be successful, we needed to get every pharmacist in every store trained so that people could depend on getting their shot and not have to worry about which Walgreens was going to carry their shot. And so I remember he asked me, he was silent for a little bit, and he said, do you really know what you're asking for? And he was, you know, talking about the the pushback that we might get from pharmacists who were already a bit overloaded and um, and thought about it. And then he gave me permission to move forward with the expectation that every pharmacist would be trained. So we trained and we trained and not knowing that a pandemic was getting ready to breathe down our neck. And um, but when H1N1 hit, we were prepared to offer the flu shot in nearly every store in our district. And it was very busy. It was a very busy, very tough time. Um, but the pharmacists rose to the challenge and we worked through the obstacles that got in our way. And we gave a tremendous amount of shots in a very quick period of time. So many that I was actually invited to go meet with the corporate folks and sit down at a big table and talk about what went well, what could be improved, and they implemented a lot of those changes that we talked about. And so I've been involved in giving flu shots and other vaccines ever since. Amazing. Who knew these, these breadcrumbs that were going to lead to this next phase in your life? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. I love this story. Thank you so much. Frank, how about you? What's your Cliff Notes version? So for me, so don't be intimidated. First of all, I'm just a normal guy, right? I uh, um, that just, you know, I'm a normal guy. It's fascinated by science. I literally grew up on a corn farm in Iowa. Uh, my parents were sharecroppers. Um, like, like no joke. We were sharecroppers. Um, I always joke that I was the um, last kid in America to milk a cow by hand before school. I was just, you know, just a little farm kid. Um, always liked science, and uh, but didn't know what to do with it. Uh, went to college, and kid you not, I majored in chemistry um, because uh, physics wasn't an option. Uh, it just, you know, they only had a minor in physics, and I was like, oh, nuts, I made a wrong decision. Well, I guess I'll try chemistry. And then it just kind of turned into something that I loved. Um, and for me, the thing that really drives me is research. Uh, so it was a year after, or it was my sophomore year in college, I got involved with a program through the National Science Foundation to fund kids from smaller colleges, like what I went to, to go to uh, bigger schools and do research and, and um, during the summers. So it became a summer job for me, you know, which was a good thing. But, uh, but yeah, I just, I fell in love with this idea of actually that I could do the science and stuff. I've always liked teaching as well. I kind of went to college thinking I would be a science teacher because that was like the only thing I knew. And then, uh, then I found out that I could do kind of both teaching and research together. And so, you know, my wife always teases me that I never left college. I've never grown up, uh, but uh, it, it's a good life. Um, I'll say if anyone's listening and you or some of your kids or someone you know wants to, uh, well, you know, like science, make sure that you find a place when they go to college where they can do research, right? Like uh, that, that's the beauty of science is that it's not just something you read in the textbooks. It's something you can actually do. Like, and you can actually be a part of kind of like writing chapters on the end of the textbook. That's what just gets me excited. I love that. He's already talking metaphors, Holland. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hang on to those. Uh-huh. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So I know we took out the part about having, uh, about telling our own stories. We usually tell a little story from our own lives that has to do with the topic right at the beginning. And I was thinking about it and when I was going through the script and I was like, no, we just need to plunge right in. We've got these two great guests and so forth. However, I've been thinking about it. <clears throat> and I remember story, being in seventh grade. I remember being in seventh grade and I lived in the Philippines and went to an international school. So my mother signed me up for what felt like about 100 vaccinations. And I showed up in the nurse's office for a vaccination I was very upset about having to get. And there was a little girl, probably first grade in there. She was really nervous about getting an injection. So the nurse says, oh, it's nothing, honey. Look at this boy from middle school. He'll come up here. Come on up here and show her how it's done. So as soon as they put that needle in my arm, I screamed like I was being murdered. That little girl hit the roof and 
pretty much the nurse did too. She didn't give me any candy after that. She was like, just go back to class. <laughs> so that's what I remember about vaccinations right there. Amy, do you have a story? I don't want to like not, after I, after I said, well, let's not do them this time. <laughs> oh, but this is making me laugh so much. Um, I don't know if you, if you remember from our episode about um, women and voting um, with, Sha- with um, yes. Um, Okay. Shanice Mangle and um, um, Lawson Wetley. Her memory of going in to vote with her parents was a smell. Do you remember that? Yeah. Now that you tell me, yes. Yeah. Well, my my memory of vaccinations is a smell. I can remember my mom taking me to a huge, at that point, because I was just little, uh, elementary school. And we were being led into a cafeteria, I guess, or a gym, something. And I smelled this, this odor. It was the alcohol as they were putting that on the skin. And I could just smell that smell. So when I think of, when I think of vaccinations and shots and that, that smell always comes to mind and it takes me back to being in that place. But, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful um, for this conversation because I have a feeling Holland, we are going to learn a lot, but I think for some of us, we may need to get on the same playing field with Brenton and Tiffany. So we're going to do a rapid fire uh, language dig into some words that might help everyone understand a little bit more about this topic. And it doesn't matter who takes the word or both of you can take the word. Um, No quizzes. We just want to make sure that we're all on a level playing field. So here's our first word. Active immunity. What is it? I can take that one. Um, so this is the type of immunity and that can come from natural disease. So say, for example, you get chicken pox as a child and you recover from that and you develop antibodies to protect you against that virus. You have natural active immunity that hopefully stays with you the rest of your life. You can also get that kind of immunity from a vaccine. Um, Because in both of these cases, whether it's natural or the vaccine, your body's making antibodies that will be able to recognize that infection and protect you from future infection with that same pathogen. Wow, you have used a bunch of words that we're going to have to start. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have anything to add to that one? No, I guess other than just the fact that natural immunity is the goal. I mean, we can Mm. talk about that more as we go. But, uh, yeah, the, and natural immunity is your body fighting off disease. And you know, as right. we talk about vaccines, that's what we want. We want to make that happen. Okay, so you, you both have used that word, antibody. Help us out. What are you talking about? I can handle that one. So, All right. Okay, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try to keep down the, uh, you know, the nerdy words. But uh, for, to me, as a chemist, an antibody is a molecule. It is a molecule that exists in your body naturally. Your body makes them um, all the time. They're actually, again, as molecules, they're quite big. Uh, And uh, they are, if you see any, you know, if you see anything on TV or anything, if you've read anything about kind of, you know, vaccines and how they work, they're the Y-shaped things. They're shaped like the letter Y. Uh, Yeah, like kind of a, a center and two arms off them. And what they do is they are kind of like, I don't know, they're, they are basically looking for bad things in your body. They, they are the things that identify invaders into your body, basically. And so that invader could be a bacteria, could be a, could be a, a virus like we're going to talk about. But what they do is they are just literally floating through your body. And, and when they find something that's not supposed to be there, they stick to it. And that, that's their goal. And, and so, so when you develop, to, to bring the two together, when you develop natural immunity, that means that your body has antibodies that can stick to some virus or bacteria or, or, some, or, or some foreign invader, basically. Almost sounds like a, um, a Miss Pac-Man game, Holland. <laughs> Going and getting all the, all the bad stuff. Tiffany, you got something else for us? Well, I just I teach my students in class that antibodies are sort of like stormtroopers that are marching through the body, waiting to find the bad guy and 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 take it away. Um, so that's my Star Wars analogy from my I love, it. I love Star Wars. <laughs> I love it. All right, how about pathogen? Um, it's just an organism that causes disease in the body. 
So that's the bad guy? That's the yeah, that's the bad guy. Mm. The one we don't want, we want to get rid of it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the bad guy. It could be a, you know, it could be a bacteria, again, a virus. Um, we can get into the debate of whether viruses are alive or not. Uh, but uh, um, a virus, bacteria, fungus, any, any kind of, it's, it's the bad guy that, that you're targeting. That's right. Okay. All right. Clinical trial. We've heard a lot of that in the news lately. So I, I read a lot of these in my job. Um, these are really studies that allow researchers to find out if a new treatment like a new drug, a medical device, or a vaccine is safe and effective to be used in people. Um, that's the simplest way to say it. And there's usually multiple phases that start out with usually animals first to make sure it's safe in animals, and then moves to small amounts of humans up to larger amounts of humans trials before it can be um, presented for use to the mass population. Okay. And Branson, you mentioned you did some, some work in that area. So I haven't ever run a clinical trial, but lots of, uh, you know, people at my university are running clinical trials. So like one of my best friends has run a clinical trial recently. Um, and so what a clinical trial, I, I guess maybe I'm going to introduce one other term into this, if you don't mind, that's a double blind trial. And so what that means, that's kind of the best way these are done. That's kind of like the gold standard of how to test things. And that's where you have, you know, the other good word here, placebo, right? Where you have half the people in the trial get the treatment and the other half get the placebo and they don't know which one has gotten which, right? And even in fact, the researchers don't know, that's the double of the double blind, don't know, uh, don't know who has placebo and who has been uh, treated. And then you watch for the outcomes. And, uh, and so that way, uh, you know, that way you can really control and you know, the, difference, uh, the di different health outcomes that, that occur are really from the treatment. Excellent. All right, our last word, adjuvant. Well, those are, those are typically just agents that are added to a vaccine just to kind of boost the immune response, just so our body will have a little bit more of an immune response is kind of act, mimicking active disease. So if you had, because typically if you get the natural infection, you're going to develop a more robust immune response. So the adjuvants are, are trying to kind of simulate that same response in the body. Usually it's a protein or something added that's going to cause that immune immunity to be a little more responsive. That's right. So any drug will have what's normally called the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And that's the molecule that really is, is you know, the quote unquote cure. That, that is, that's the molecule that's doing the work. But a lot of times there's, there's additional things that are added. And those are the adjuvants. And like, like, uh, like what Tiffany's saying, they just kind of boost your response to the, uh, um, to the, to the API itself. API, live all these... And, uh, got it. <laughs> All right. Okay, with that um, vocabulary background, I'd like to go back a little bit historically and think about vaccinations. From what I found uh, in reading about this, the first vaccine was developed in 1796, and it was to inoculate people against smallpox. After a major vaccination effort from 1958 to 1977, the world basically eradicated smallpox, although we still have the vaccine um, to protect us against bioterrorism. So what else should we know about the story of vaccines from the late 1700s to the present? So just from a word standpoint, um, as you may realize, Edward Jenner kind of pioneered the concept of vaccines. He uh, not only gave us this first vaccine, smallpox vaccine, but he actually coined the word vaccination. Um, the term vaccination comes from the Latin word for cow that means va that's vaca. And um, the smallpox virus is in the same family as cowpox virus, which was where Jenner was originally concentrating his, his work to develop the smallpox vaccine. So I thought that was kind of interesting how we ended up getting that word. And, you know, thanks to his efforts, this really, um, we have a wealth of vaccines available today. I mean, much of the 1800s was really just spent trying to identify diseases and understand the immunology in our bodies and how immunity could be achieved through vaccines. And we had vaccines developed for cholera, diphtheria, typhoid, rabies. And then in the 1900s, efforts related to polio, pneumococcal, yellow fever, and, and many of the vaccines that we have today. 
So it's um, it's a really amazing if you look at the timeline for vaccines and how much has come out in a relatively short period of time. No, I, I think about um, when I would read those short stories. Uh, this is about animals, not people, but all creatures great and small, the James Harriet stories Mm -hmm. set in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And he talks about in the very beginning when he first joined the uh, the, uh, veterinary practice in the Yorkshire Dales in the 1930s, they were still basically treating people with what he called witchcraft. And then vaccines and antibiotics came on the scene and everything completely transformed almost overnight. So, sorry, Brent, I mean to interrupt. I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what she was saying there. No, I, I was just going to jump in and say that uh, that vaccine research, and we can talk a little bit more about this as we go here, but vaccine research has actually been around, like you're saying, for quite a while. Now, and to what Tiffany said, I mean, we didn't really understand a lot in the 1800s. Um, but I think, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump to it. I think that the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines that we're seeing now in particular, although some of the other ones are, are excellent too, uh, are a, a quantum leap ahead in, in now in the way that we're going to be able to develop these things. Um, from a scientific standpoint, I, I think it's, it's just really exciting to see this. I, I think it's excellent science. We can talk about it. Uh, but, uh, but also just from a public health standpoint, I think we're going to be much better going forward. Uh, I think I think what you're going to see is that vaccines will, will become just, just so much better now than they even have been in the past. I love that, Brenton, because you have just segued perfectly into our next question. Because if you think about what has happened, you just, you alluded to it, the history of vaccines and someone, you know, having that hesitancy. Because at the beginning, like Holland was saying, it, we went from witchcraft to, oh, this works, you know, and so we had to make this, this mental leap. And then you do have those tragic situations like uh, American Calvinist preacher, Jonathan Edwards, who died from taking the smallpox vaccine. So we do have a background regarding vaccine hesitancy, but Brenton, I want you to kind of take this one home a little bit. You're saying maybe we don't need to think about that in, uh, in this current day and age. It may have been in the past, but maybe not now. Well, so, I mean, I think, first of all, it's, I, I think vaccine inher- uh, hesitancy is totally normal. But, you know, I don't think anybody's excited about shots, right? Like everybody has horror stories, right, of, of shots, and uh, especially of parents having your kids get shots. You know, it, it's just kind of traumatic to watch your kid cry right there as it happens. I mean, I, I'm a parent. I did it, too. I remember holding my daughter down on the table while they gave her the shots. You know, that's, that's something no one's excited about doing. You know, uh, but there's, but the the health payoff of doing it is, is what you have to keep in, in, in mind, right? So vaccine hesitancy is, is, is absolutely a real thing. I, I completely understand, right? Like I, I really do. Uh, but uh, but at the end of the day, you know, these shots make us healthy. At the end of the day, right? And I, I think you have to kind of keep that keep that in mind. Uh, uh, one thing that's been curious to me for years. I actually wrote a proposal about this, never got funded. I wanted to, to work on this a little more. Uh, yeah, just as a, as a researcher, when we uh, get money from the National Science Foundation, we have, to, we have to write about broader impacts of our science, and we have to talk about uh, kind of like ways that we could not just be good scientists, but be good citizens. And so one of the things I wrote about was about vaccine hesitancy in, uh, uh, in the evangelical church and how you actually see that there's, there's um, a lot higher rates of, of vaccine hesitancy within uh, – uh, evangelical Christians that that I, I found surprising at the time, uh, but uh, but I you know I studied a little bit and I it really is true we were you know I was proposing to, to work with pastors and missionaries to try to talk more about these types of topics, um, and so anyway so it, it really is true and absolutely no one wants a shot but uh, um, but yeah I understand. I, I guess I don't want to dominate the conversation too much. I don't know. Tiffany, do you want to jump in and say something? Then I can talk about the science of, of like I said, these new wave vaccines a little bit. But like I said, I, I don't want to make sure I don't dominate too much here. Yeah, no, you're, you're doing great. And Tiffany can jump in. But we'll, we'll talk about maybe some of the new wave of this vaccine in, in a little bit, um, in just a little bit. But Tiffany, what have you got? Well, in 2019, the World Health Organization actually said vaccine hesitancy is one of the top 10 global threats. 
Um, we know time and time again, if we stop vaccinating, diseases resurface, they will. I mean, disease is really just a plane right away, if you think about it. I mean, it's so easily transported into the, the United States. So, you know, if we stop vaccinating here, even if we don't see disease right here in the country, I mean, how many people have actually seen measles? But we know that when we stop vaccinating, you know, you'll, you'll get disease outbreak um, of it. Um, but you know, there, there's been a history of exploitive research um, that's been done. I mean, you have the infamous syphilis studies in Tuskegee, Alabama, that um, doctors withheld treatment from hundreds of black men from the 1930s to the 1970s. And this contributes to some skepticism about, you know, medical research. Is it really on the up and up. And for a long time, I think regular people have been left out of vaccine development until it was time to get the shot. I mean, you never even really thought about what all went into it. Um, researchers were publishing paper on their research, maybe thinking that they were getting the word out there, but are lay people really understanding what all goes into it? And, and now you have such easy access to the internet and social media that, you know, people really feel like they need to be informed and they want to be part of the process. But Unfortunately, through the social media and internet, there's um, some misinformation that circulates. And sometimes that misinformation really increases vaccine hesitancy out there. Um, so, you know, we, we are in a position also to use social media and those resources, you know, to help correct some of those, um, that misinformation that it is out there and encourage people to get the vaccine. Oh, that's such a good word. And, you know, man, Britton, I want you to go, I want you to push that research again. You, you, what a perfect time to do your research. Um, I, I, I would be interested to see if it wouldn't pass um, uh, for approval now. Yeah, th this definitely needs done. I, I agree. Yeah. And so there yeah. is one thing I did, uh, kind of how uh, I got, uh, how I started speaking up about this now was, uh, you know, just through like social media, I just started, I saw a lot of people, I'm not on Facebook too much. My wife posts most of our, uh, most of the stuff, but uh, I saw a lot of people asking questions about these vaccines and just not kind of, you know, and a lot of rumors uh, stirring. And so I just made a real simple post. This was back in December, just saying, do you have questions about the new vaccines? I'm happy to help. I'll try to answer what I can. And, um, and my gosh, I just spent like the next four days just, just, you know, replying to, to all the people that were just, you know, kind of our friends and then friends of friends and people I'd never met, <laughs> you know, start, start filling up our inbox and uh, just answering some of these questions. So I think there's just a lot of, uh, you know, hesitancy and just, you know, and there's definitely misinformation out there uh, that kind of combined with hesitancy. That's, that's a perfect storm, you know? And so, I, I think we need to just do our best to, uh, as scientists, as practitioners, to to just try to explain things as best as we can. So, yeah, so I'm, oh, and then I should say after that, uh, that's part of the reason I think Holland called me about this podcast, but, you know, I got invited to do a, um, a podcast for a whole series of evangelical missionaries and Christians, uh, well, Christians, of course, missionaries and pastors uh, all throughout Asia, where they had lots of questions about this. And so, uh, you know, it's just a friend of ours had invited me to do that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of amazing how much, and just how many questions people have. And so that's what we're trying to do here. Tiffany, did you have anything you wanted to come back with or? Um, no, I mean, I think it's, okay. I think it's very well said, but I think we probably do need to recognize that there are um, people that are totally against vaccines. They call themselves anti-vaxxers, or at least that's what they're known as. I don't know if they call, that's what they call themselves. And they've been around since the 1800s. I think in 1882, the first group got together against smallpox and said that it was caused by silt and um, not by a contagion. And that became a very popular and correct argument um, that we know now. It's definitely not caused by filth, it's caused by a pathogen. But, um, but there's, there are certain groups out there that really make it their mission to discredit vaccines. And, and that makes it harder um, when that's kind of in the mix and circulating. I love the backstory for all this. This is fascinating. I think uh, I think one of the concerns people have is that single mandatory, and in fact, in the 19th century, both England and some U.S. states experimented with making vaccines mandatory, and parents could be fined or imprisoned for not vaccinating their infants. What do you think are some of the pros and cons around mandatory vaccination? So, um, 
as far as the cons against it, people will really feel like their rights have been taken away when you mandate vaccines. As recently, I think, as in 2015, and there may be something even more recent than this, in California, there was a bill that mandated vaccines in children, specifically after in 2014, there was a big outbreak of measles in Disneyland. And um, that bill was supported by Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, but there were some people so strongly against it that they were issuing death threats to these senators who were trying to get this bill passed. Ultimately, it was enacted um, and uh, vaccinations, people could get out of having to vaccinate their children if they had medical justification of it. And what they found out was there were a lot of unjustified uh, medical exemptions being offered so that children didn't have to take the vaccine. But ultimately, long story short, it did end up with more and more children getting vaccinated because at that time, in some pockets of California, only about 60% of kids were actually vaccinated, which is low because when we look at vaccination rates for most children, they're 90 plus percent. Um, so, so that you know shows that when it's mandated, we are going to get more vaccinations, but these um, certain groups have have insisted that this violates their civil liberties, and um, they're even raised suspicions that it's pharmaceutical industry making money off of it, and that's why they're doing it, which I don't think that's the case. But um, but so the the benefit the benefit of it though would be that by having people vaccinated, they're supposed to we can develop herd immunity. So basically what that means, when you have enough people in a group of people that are vaccinated, the likelihood of spreading disease becomes very low. And that's what we're after. Um, as you've probably heard with the COVID vaccine that we've still got a ways to go before we'll reach herd immunity, uh, maybe not even be able to do it this year. But, um, but yeah, that's our ultimate goal. So we can kind of stop the transmission of the disease. Yeah, what's, what's kind of unique uh, to these types of arguments about vaccines is that, or, and about herd immunity, is that, I guess that's the point, is that it kind of only works if everybody or nearly everybody does it. You know, that's how we eradicate something. You know, if you get vaccinated, you will protect yourself but, uh, uh, from the disease, but the way to eradicate the disease is if everybody does it. And that's difficult, right? Especially, you know, we can talk uh, about you know free society and all and such here but um uh you know if i think that's all the more reason why scientists practitioners we need to and even just you know everyday people need to encourage each other to to be uh to you know in thoughtful conversations like this uh to to try to do the right thing here that the public health is really important here um yeah excellent Excellent. You know, it's, it is interesting, um, you know, everyone doing their part, everyone rolling up their sleeves and, and some, some people have, have aligned what we're dealing with right now with COVID like a war. And, you know, when you think about what everyone did back in World War I and World War II to eradicate and come, you know, rise to the occasion, you know, that's the hope. And so we really appreciate you all coming and being part of the afterward conversation tonight uh, to do some of that and to dispel some of the, the rumors. And, and I, again, just so appreciate the history. You know, if we don't know our history, we're bound to repeat it. Well, if in, in 1882, we're beginning with our first anti-vaxxers, as Stephanie said, this isn't new stuff. We need to learn from it. Um, so as we close out this first part of this conversation. Um, both of you would love to hear, what would you say is an essential element that we need to understand the stories about vaccination? Brent, I'll start with you first. So I think the essential thing about vaccines is that, is, is kind of going back to this idea of natural immunity, that this is actually what we're gonna get, what a vaccine does for you is it makes your body able to defeat the disease. Right. This is just a way that we can train your body to defeat the, the disease. It's very different than a drug, which is attacking the the uh, the, uh, the the pathogen by itself or whatever. Uh, vaccines are arguably a more natural <laughs> form of defense, a more a more natural way to make your body healthier. Um, you know, I, I guess that's what I try to say when when I'm talking to someone who who's hesitant about vaccines is that at the end of the day, this is yeah, this is just training your body. To, to, fight it, to fight the disease itself. It's just making you healthier. 
right? Not actually making you dependent on some cholesterol lowering drug or something like that, right? This is just one dose, well, two doses normally, right? But, but uh, you know, we're going to dose you with this and then your body will know how to beat the disease afterwards. You have just flipped it on its head. I love that. That's awesome. What about you, Tiffany? And Brayton, I think I'm going to have to steal your words, the train your body to defeat the disease. That is such a nice way to put it. I really, really like that. Um, you know, we can look through history, as I mentioned before, and when we see these diseases decrease, it's because there's a vaccine that's able to, to help that happen. I mean, for example, when you look back on smallpox, smallpox was feared for 3,000 years at a 30% death rate. And it was only until after we started mass vaccinations that we got rid of it. And the last case was reported in Somalia in I think 1977. Um, but we have to vaccinate to get rid of the diseases. We know that. And we know that if we stop doing it, diseases will come back. But we also have to understand that vaccines are not without risk. So we're never going to be able to say that you're not going to have a side effect or they're 100% without problems because that's not the case. But as everything we do in medicine, you have to evaluate risk versus benefit. And in this case, vaccines totally outweigh the risk of natural disease in many cases. Even if you're not the person that is at high risk for dying of COVID or whatever, we're also doing this for those around us in our community that are at high risk. And so that's what I think we need to take away and remember with the vaccine. Thanks for sharing. Um, and we wanna go ahead and, uh, and put a pin in the conversation right now and say a special thanks to Tiffany and Brenton uh, from Presbyterian College and the University of Rhode Island. This is a vital conversation. Um, and while you wait for part two, please, please go to theafterwardpodcast.com and become a subscriber. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts from and tell your friends about us. And as always, you are welcome at our table.